My name is George Patton. I'm the president and founder of Frontier Mission International, and I'm bringing to you some teaching today. This is teaching that we've done around the world in some 33 countries now. We're working in 50 plus countries, and uh, so I wanted to make this available to you uh, on the internet and the media. I hope it's really a blessing to you. Today I want to talk to you about hearing the voice of God. You know, before you can receive the power of God, you have to hear the voice of God. When we look in, in Acts chapter 1, if you take your Bibles and, and turn there with me, in Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now this is Jesus talking. Then when you get down to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be a witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the world. Before you can receive the power of God, you have to be able to hear the voice of God. Now in, in John chapter 10, come over there with me if you would. In John chapter 10 and, and verse 14, Jesus is talking. He says, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Then in verse 16 it says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring. They shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And then in verse 27, Jesus goes on and it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Four things I want you to notice today. First, God still speaks today. Secondly, there is a God, and He communicates with man. Third, man can recognize the voice of God. And finally, God has something to say. Now, there are many voices in the world today, and none of them are without recognition. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 10, the Bible says, there are, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. All kinds of voices in the world today, and many of these voices are competing for our attention, and they're competing for our time. So many voices coming at us from so many different areas. I want us to look briefly at some of the voices that we hear around the world today. The first is the voice of man. In Acts chapter 5, in verse 29, it says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Now you remember what is taking place. Peter and John had gone up to the temple about the hour of prayer. And then how that the, there was a lame man. He was begging for alms. And Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus, get up. Now I'm paraphrasing there. But it says that the blind man stood up. He began leaping and praising God. Well, then many people tried to say Peter and John had done something. And Peter and John said, we've not done anything. This is Jesus who has done this. Jesus of Nazareth whom you crucified. Well, the leaders take Peter and John and they threaten them. If you continue to preach in this name of Jesus, we're going to beat you. We're going to put you in jail. Maybe we'll even kill you. And you remember they went back to their own company and they prayed. And they were threatening Peter and John about preaching in the name of Jesus. Peter says, we would rather listen to the voice of God than the voice of man. So we see one of the voices that we hear today is the voice of man. Now, sometimes the voice of man can encourage us, but sometimes the voice of man can be distracting. So we see this is just yet one of the voices that is competing for our attention, the voice of man. Another voice that we we see is the voice of Satan in Genesis chapter 3. If you'll take your Bible and turn over there with me. Genesis chapter 3. We know the story, Adam and Eve. 
Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. Then look at verse 5. It says, For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. One of the voices that's competing for our attention today is the voice of the devil. You know, the, the devil tempts us, I believe, especially in the United States, through subtile ways. Speaking to us here, does God's word really say this? Does God's word really apply to us today? Does God really, or did God really mean it like this? I mean, after all, God knew how we were made, and God knows our hang-ups, and God knows our faults. So did God really? You see, this is yet another voice. You remember even Jesus was tempted by the voice of Satan. When we look in Luke chapter 4 at the, the, the mountain temptation, how that three times the devil came and tried to tempt Christ. So we, we have the voice of man. We have the voice of the devil. But then we also see there is the voice of the demons. Look in Acts chapter 8 and verse 7. Acts chapter 8 and verse 7. It says there, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many, taken with palsies, many that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Sometimes the devil will speak audibly through someone who is possessed with the demon. Oftentimes, the devil speaks through his demons or the demon speaks through lies and deceits and sinful thoughts in our mind. You see, the devil is not omnipresent, but he does have his own minions, his own demonic angel league, if you would, who is working with him. And so it's those whispers that we hear, those deceits or those things coming in our eyes. You know, even on on television and Facebook and many of these other medias, how that the, the devil is coming through, on that the demon forces are coming through on that. So you see, around the world, there's so many different kinds of voices. The voice of man, there's the voice of the devil, there's the voice of demons, but then there's also the voice of self. Look in, in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 3, we know this story, how there was the unjust steward, the unrighteous steward, who had been wrongly spending his master's things. It says in chapter 16, verse 1, it says, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him, and he said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer steward. Then said the steward within himself, the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away me the stewardship. I cannot dig, and to beg I am ashamed. So you see, he said within himself, there's the voice of self that's always talking to us trying to get us to go one way or the other. Now we know that the flesh is a wicked thing. The flesh has a mind of its own many times. And so even our own flesh, our own mind, is trying to lead us in a wrong area. Turn over, Luke chapter 18. We know the story of the widow and the judge. It says, And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them, to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversaries. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her lest by her continued coming she worry me. Verse 4, he said, but after all, he said within himself. 
So you see, once again, there's the voice of self that's trying to distract us and lead us away. Oh my goodness. My friends, there's so many voices today in the world. There's the voice of man. There's the voice of Satan. There's the voice of the demons. There's the voice of self. But then there's the voice that I want to talk to you about. And that is the voice of God. In John chapter 10, come back with me. John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 1. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus is speaking, He that entereth in not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the poor openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he hath put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, believers are compared to as sheep. Jesus, of course, as the great shepherd. His sheep will know his voice, and others they will not hear. Now, it's amazed me as I've traveled throughout the world, many times if we're in one of the larger cities, such as Nairobi or Kampala, or even in Kathmandu or some of these other larger cities around the world, the capital cities, sometimes we'll have opportunity that we'll go down to a park and we'll just be walking around and spending some time with the pastors. Well, down at the park are many times, it's, it just always, it never ceases to amaze me. You'll see there'll be a, a line of benches and the mamas in, will be sitting on the benches and their children will be out riding the slides and swinging on the swings and all these things. But when a certain mama decides she's going home, she calls to her children. Now maybe the rest of the children look up, but they don't come because it's not the voice of their mama. They know the voice of their mama. Why? Because they've spent enough time with their mama that they know the mama's voice and other mamas they will not listen to. It's the same thing with Jesus. You see, that's why it's so important for us as Christians to spend more time with Jesus. Because the more time we spend with Him, the more we know His voice. And all these other voices, the voices of man, the voices of the Satan, the voices of the demons, the voices of self, will not listen to. We'll only listen to the voice of Jesus. Now, when we read Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, we find the creation of the world. We find the creation of man. From the very beginning, God communed with man. He had fellowship with man. He walked in the cool of the evening with man. Now, God gave Adam the care of the entire garden. Now, it's suspected that this garden covered something like three or four countries. That's how big the garden was. God told Adam to, to dress and to keep the garden. Now, when God would come to Adam in the cool of the evening, it was not to check on Adam's progress, to see how the job was going of dressing or cultivating and keeping the garden. No, he would come because he wanted to have fellowship with Adam. It's the same thing today. God wants to have fellowship with us to walk with us, to talk with us. God gave Adam and Eve specific instructions. Name the animals, tend the garden, have companionship, reproduce, all of these things. Most importantly, maintain fellowship. God communicated his plan to them. Look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. It says in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now I want you to notice something in the verse above. It's kind of getting off of our subject here. But many times we have the idea that 
Eve was the first one that sinned. But I want you to look there in Genesis, since you're there, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. It says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress and to keep the garden. Now dress, we know, is to tend, to cultivate. Keep is to guard. Because the same word is used in Psalm 127 and verse 1, where it says, Unless the Lord keep the city, the watchman watcheth but in vain. Well, it's apparent that Adam was the first to sin. He wasn't guarding the garden or guarding his wife. Now, I don't know whether Adam was negligent or whether he was delinquent, but something happened. He was not guarding his garden. Men, you men that are listening, I want you to realize it's not your wife's job to guard the garden. We're still, as men, given the charge to be priests over our own homes. It's our job to guard our garden and to keep the snakes out. Now, that has nothing to do with hearing the voice of God. But I want you to realize the important task you have at guarding your garden. Well, we know that Adam and Eve, they listened to the wrong voice. They listened to the voice of the devil. And you see in Genesis chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more subtile than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. And the servant said unto, and the, unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I want you to see here, look in verse 6 of chapter 3, look in verse 6, and see how it is that the devil tempted Eve. It says, And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice, it says, she saw the tree was good for food, the lust of the eyes, and that it was uh, man, the lust of the flesh. She saw the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh. She saw it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, the pride of life. It's the same way the devil still tempts today. When you look over, in Matthew chapter 4, I want you to see this. Come to Matthew chapter 4. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The lust of the flesh. Lord, it, or Jesus, if you be the Son of God, make these stones be made bread to feed yourself. The lust of the flesh. You see, it was the same temptation that he used with Eve. Now he's using it on Jesus. But then look what Jesus says. Then the devil taketh him up into a holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and into their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time they shall dash thy foot against a stone. The lust of the eyes. In other words, what the devil is saying, cast yourself off of the temple. The people will see. They'll believe you're the Son of God. After all, the Bible has said, you see, the devil took two pieces of Scripture out of context and he gave it back to Jesus. The devil still does that today. Think not, dear friends, that the devil does not know the Word of God, for he does. He knows how to misuse it. So Jesus was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. But then look in verse 8. 
It says, And the devil taketh him up into exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and said unto them, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. And Jesus said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. The pride of life. You see, the devil took him up and he said, I'll give you all these things. Trying to build on his pride. You see, Jesus was tempted in all like manner, such as us. Took him up and he said, I'll give you all of these if you worship me. The same temptation he used with Eve. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now go with me to 1 John chapter 2. I want you to see this. I want you to grasp this today. John chapter 2. It says in John chapter 2, 1 John, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Brothers and sisters, the beginning of the book, the center of the book, and the end of the book, the same way the devil is tempting today. The same way He's trying to deceive today the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But I want you to notice something. Notice the way there, how Jesus fought with Satan. Come back with me. Go back to Matthew chapter 4. Get back to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And then look again. Verse 7. Verse seven Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. And then once again, in verse 10, this is, Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, and 10, verse 20. You see, Jesus used the word of God to fight with the devil. I want you to realize something. Say today that you go to the president of the U.S., and the president gives you a message to carry to the president of Russia, perhaps. The message that you carry has the power of the president behind it. Because it's not your message. You are only the carrier of the message. Friends, I want you to realize God's word in your mouth is just as powerful as if it's in God's mouth. Because it's not your word. It's God's word in your mouth. So it has the power of God coming in behind it. This is the way you can fight with the devil. You see, you are not left without. That's why it's so important for us to put the word of God in our heart. So that way we have something to fight with. Well, we know of Adam and Eve, they didn't listen. They listened to the voice of Satan rather than the voice of God. Look in, in chapter 3 again. Go back to chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3. I really want you to get onto this today and grab hold of this. Genesis chapter 3, in verse 8. It says, And when they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now I want you to see something. Before Adam and Eve sinned, 
They were clothed in the glory of God. Now we know in Exodus 33, Moses had been with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He had been in the presence of God. And you remember how that Moses said, Lord, I just want to see your face. And God said, no one can see me and live, but I'll put you in the crevice of a rock and I'll put my hand over the rock. And as I pass by, I'll take my hand away. Then you can see my hinder parts as I pass by. You remember Moses came down and he had the glory of God upon him, upon his face. His face showed so much it scared the people. You see, Adam and Eve were clothed in the glory of God. But then when sin came in, the glory departed. And now they see themselves as naked. They went, with, they went and hid themselves. Friends, is that not just exactly what we do? When we listen to the wrong voice, we've been deceived by the voice of man or the voice of the devil or the voice of the demons or the voice of, uh, of self. Is that not how we do? The first thing we put away is prayer and Bible study. We go away from it because we got off in sin. Rather than running to God, seeking forgiveness, we run away from God. Oh, my friends, the Lord is always quick to forgive. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we know they listen to the voice of the devil, the glory departed. Now they were naked. They hid themselves. Sin separates us from the presence of God, from the voice of God. Sin results in a hardened heart. God wants you to know His will for you. To know God's will, you have to know God's voice. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Come with me over there. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now why would the Apostle Paul have written that if it wasn't possible for us to understand the will of the Lord? You see, we can understand the will of the Lord, but to do that we have to hear the voice of the Lord to understand the will of the Lord. We know His voice. We can know His will when He speaks to us. Look in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4 again. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, but, but Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth. Circle, draw a line under that word, proceedeth. That word proceedeth, it's an ongoing function. It means past, the things God has spoken, present, the things God is speaking, and future, the things that God will speak. You see, God still speaks today. Proceedeth is an action word, it's a continuing word. Now, how can we know it is the voice of God that we are listening to? There are two words, two Greek words that are used in the Bible to mean word of God. Now we know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic. There are two words in the Greek that are used for word of God. The first one is logos. The second one is rhema. The logos is the written word of God. The rhema is the living or life-giving word of God. You can see both of these words used in Acts chapter 17. Come to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word, they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They received the spoken word, the rhema word. 
that the apostles had spoken. They received the life-giving word. But then it says they searched the scriptures daily, the written word, to see if those things were so. They received the rhema. They searched the logos. I want you to notice something. The rhema and the logos must agree together. The spoken word of God and the written word of God will always agree together or it is not a word from God. Someone comes to you and they say, we've got a word from you, for you, from the Lord. And you search the scriptures and you find it contrary to the written word of God. I want you to see that is not a word from God because God will never contradict his written word. The Logos and the Rhema must agree together. The written word and the spoken word will always agree together. You remember as we were studying in, in Matthew chapter 4, the devil had a word from God. In the second temptation, he says, but the Lord says he'll give his angels charge over you that you'll not dash your foot against a stone. He, he came out of Psalm 91, but he used the word out of context. He falsely used the word. So you see, it did not line up with the rest of Scripture. The spoken word and the written word must always agree. Now the rhema word, the life-giving word, usually applies to a specific need. You've been praying about something and you've been, you've been toiling and praying and, and just uh, really seeking God on something and, and you hear the pastor preach or maybe you hear uh, someone on the radio preaching or, so, or, or, or someone comes and they give a word to you and, and you've been praying about something and that's that life-giving word that God has given you. But now remember, it must line up with the written word. They have to agree together. Or, now the Logos word is the written word. Now, that, that when God speaks through his, his written word, maybe in your devotion time, maybe the pastor is preaching a sermon and there's something in that text that just grabs onto you. Whether it's the rhema word, the life-giving word, or the logos word, the Holy Spirit takes, takes that spoken word, that written word, and strikes your spirit with it. And you just feel something inside of you leap with inside of you. That's the Spirit of God striking you with the voice of God, you see. So you can hear the voice of God today. You can hear the voice of God through His word. You can hear the voice of God through spoken word. But you have to have the Spirit of God working in you to have this happen. Now, when we sin, the, the Spirit doesn't leave the house. I want you to see something in, in John, in John chapter 14. I want you to realize you have to have the Spirit of God working in you to hear the voice of God. John chapter 14. In John chapter 14 and verse 17. John chapter 14, verse 17. It says, even the spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwell with you and shall be in you. Now the Holy Spirit dwelling with us, that's to draw us into that salvation experience. Where we trust in Christ and we, we make Jesus Lord of our life, that's with us. The spirit in you, that's after salvation. When you make Jesus Lord of your life and the Holy Spirit of God comes in, the transformation begins to take place. That's the Spirit of God in you. But then there's one other location of the Spirit of God. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That on you is what you need for the work that God has called you to do. We can't do the work of God in our own self. We have to have the Spirit of God working on us and uh, upon us to do the work He's called us to do. Even Samuel told King Saul, you remember, Saul, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will be another man. We become another person with the Spirit of God on us. But what I want you to see is you have to have that Spirit working in you. If we have sin in our life, 
If we do something the Spirit doesn't leave, He just grows quiet. I remember when my wife was still living. She's gone on to be with the Lord now. But the Bible says we sorrow not as those that have no hope. For if we put our trust in Christ, we know we'll see our loved ones again. I remember when my wife was still living. If I had done something to offend her, I would come home and the house was very quiet, which was unnatural for my wife. I didn't have to ask, dear, have I done something? But I knew by the silence in the house that I had grieved her, you see. Well, when I said, honey, have I done something? That's when she unloaded the truck. <laughs> it was quick to tell me what I had done. The same thing with the Holy Spirit, my friend. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, He doesn't leave the house. He just grows very quiet. When the Spirit of God has grown quiet in your life, that's a time you need to seek the face of God and say, Lord, show me my sin. God is faithful to show you His sin, to show you your sin, the sin He sees in you. He's faithful and He'll show you. You repent of that sin with a repentive heart, not going back into it again, the Spirit of God comes back at work again. Now, once again, you can hear the voice of God. When the Holy Spirit strikes you with a piece of Scripture, the rhema always lines up with the logos. If you get a rhema word, make sure that it lines up with the logos word. But now I want you to notice something else. Not only the two voices of God, if you would, the Logos and the Rhema. But I want you to notice different types of listeners. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, it says, in Matthew chapter 7, come with me to Matthew chapter 7. It says in Matthew chapter 7, it says, in verse, verse 24, it says, Therefore, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which buildeth his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. The hearer that listens and does. We're not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, as James would have said. In verse 26, it says that everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You see, there was the foolish hearer who heard but ignored. And then there was the, the smart hearer who heard and he done. James mentioned this as I've already alluded to. If you go to James chapter 1, it says, But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continuing therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, Jesus tells us the story. When we get to Matthew chapter 13, the, the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, Jesus is talking. He says, he says a, a sower went out to sow seeds. And as he was sowing the seeds, you remember some fell by the wayside and the birds came and took it away. He said, then there were some that fell on the stony ground. When the sun came out, it baked it. There was nothing left. He said, then there was the seed that was sown among the tares and the weeds. And it started to grow and it had taken root and it started to grow, but the thorns and the thistles and all these things grew faster and outgrew it and finally it choked it out. But then there was seed that fell on the good ground that brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100 fold of fruit. 
Notice something. The, the sower is the same person. The seed is the same seed. So the, the only difference is the ground. Now, the first piece of ground that Jesus is talking about is the wayside hearers. The wayside hearers are those that come to church on Sunday morning. They come and perhaps they bring their Bible with them. The preacher is preaching and the message is going and they're planning their calendar out for the week. They're not concerned any more about the message than anything. They're thinking about their schedule, what they need to do after that, maybe planning out their calendar, meetings they've missed the week before. These are the wayside hearers. Though the seed is going out, there's nothing that's landing. By the time they walk out the church doors, the devil has already snatched it away. There's no fruit in their lives. Then there's the stony ground hearers. These are the ones that come and they maybe they bring their Bible. They're sitting there and they're following along in the scriptures, but they're not making any notes. They're just kind of following along. Maybe their mind is back and forth between the two, double-minded, unstable. And they're thinking about tomorrow when they're trying to keep up with the sermon. Not really serious. And the sermon is finished. They close their Bible. and Maybe they even leave their Bible on the church pew. And they go out. Well, the devil's just waiting to snatch it away again. There's nothing there. The word gets baked away amidst everything else that's going on in their lives. You see, it dries up. There's no root. This was the stony ground hearers. Then there's the wayside hearers. Now, the wayside hearers are those, they, they come to church, they're making the notes, they're listening, and they're writing it all down, and they have good intentions that... This week, I'm going to go home and I'm going to meditate on what it is that the pastor has said this week. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to study what he preached on on Sunday night and on Sunday morning and maybe the Wednesday night Bible study. I'm going to get in. I'm going to dig for myself. They, they make their notes. They take their Bible. They put everything together. They fold it up. They're proudly going out the church door. And then they get home. Slowly by slowly through the week, Things began choking out the word that they received. The time of meditation that they had intended on ends up not manifesting itself. And so what happens? Well, these are the choked out hearers. The word of God came. The intention was there. The roots were there. But things choked out the word of God. They bring forth no fruit. But then there are those, the good ground hearers. They hear the word of God. They're making notes. They're taking an outline. They're really studying. They're really into it. Everything's been put on the back burner. The next day on Monday, they're in the word of God. They're studying it some more. And Tuesday, they're studying. Wednesday, they're studying on and on. They're continuing to study in that word that they hear. You see, this is how to keep from being deceived. What did I say before? The Logos and the Rhema must agree together. Why are so many being deceived in cults today? Why are so many being led astray? Because they're not hearing the voice of God. They're not going into the Scriptures themselves to see if the Rhema agrees with the Logos, you see. That's why there's so many that's being deceived, led away by false prophets. Friends, don't be one of these. Be one of those that's going to receive the Word of God, study the Word of God, get into the Word of God. Then you're going to be the good hearer, you see. What must you do to be able to hear the voice of God? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to be saved. In Romans Chapter 12. Come over there with me. In Romans chapter 12. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, we must be saved. 
Just like the natural world, in the natural world, we, we know the natural voices. We know the voice of mom or dad or brother or sister or this friend or that friend or the pastor. We know those voices because we're in relationship with those voices, so we identify those voices. Just the same in the natural world, same as in the spiritual world. The more time we spend with Jesus, the more we're going to hear His voice. If we don't have a relationship with Jesus, we can't hear His voice. Now, there's more to being saved than just saying a prayer. I'm afraid here in America, we've made it easy believism. Say this prayer, take a dip in this tank, sign this card, you're in the club, put 10% in every week and you can stay and have your membership. Jesus never said, pray and receive me into your heart. He said, pick up your cross and follow me. Make me Lord of your life, you see. It's about making Jesus Lord every day. You say, now you're talking about a works-based religion. No, I'm talking about making Jesus Lord every day. That's what he's talking about here, presenting your bodies a living sacrifice. We'd be sacrificed unto the Lord. It's no longer us. When we pray, Lord Jesus, come and be Lord of my life, that means he has control now. We're no longer in control. It's his dreams, his future, his plans. It has nothing to do with us. It's all about him now. Our time will come when we pass over into the other side, you see. But I want to encourage you, when you make Jesus Lord of your life, it'll be the greatest thing you've ever done. It's not a regret. When you make Jesus Lord, there's that peace and that joy and hearing the voice of God and, and having someone drive the boat, if you would, or fly the plane. I don't know about you, but before I became a Christian, I could certainly mess things up. But when I made Jesus Lord, the only time things get messed up now is when I bump him out of the driver's seat and I try to take control again. My friend, if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, today is the day of salvation for you. I'm going to share with you in a moment how you can make Jesus Lord, that you might hear the voice of God and walk with Him. Once you've made Jesus Lord, what do you have to do? Once you've made Jesus Lord, ask Jesus to save you. You have to have the Spirit of God working in you as I've already shared. If the Spirit of God is not working, if you grieve the Spirit of God, you will not hear the voice of God. You say, Pastor, I don't know if the Spirit of God is working in me or not. My friend, pray. Ask the Lord, Lord, show me the sin that's in my life. And when he does, start asking forgiveness. God is faithful. If you've made Jesus Lord of your life, He's faithful to show you your sin. He wants to be in communion with you. He wants to walk with you. And he doesn't want sin hindering that communion that he wants with you. You see, you have to have the Spirit of God working in your life. Not only that, not only that, you have to be separated from the world. You can't have the Spirit of God working in you if you're in love with the world. In Romans 12, it says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. We have to come out from the world. The Bible says, Come out from among them. Don't be part of them. You say, Now, preacher, you're talking about uh, walking in and just uh, with only the re re religious crowd, the righteous crowd. Yes, I am. But it doesn't mean you can't go and get the others. You know, we're, we're not called to be a showcase. We're called to go and save sinners. But that doesn't mean we have to go and live their lifestyle, dancing to their music, being entertained by their media. It means we need to live a separate lifestyle. If we're wanting to hear the voice of God, my friend, God's not going to speak to you on the television unless it's in preaching or some kind of a gospel program. God's not going to speak to you in secular music or secular media. Now, we do need to keep up with the times. I, I'm not saying that. We need to pray for the things that are going on around us. But if, if that's taking more time than the Word of God is taking in your life, you're not being transformed. You're being transformed, but not by the thing you want to be. 
We're being transformed by the world. The only way we can be transformed into what God would have us to be is His Word and in prayer, Christian media, Christian music. That's the only way. My friend, if you want to hear the voice of God, you, you, you have to separate yourself. You have to be transformed. You have to have the Spirit of God working in you. We see when, we're, when we have the Spirit of God working in us, we're led by the Spirit. You remember, sometimes it won't even make sense. You remember in Acts chapter 8, Philip is in the middle of a great revival. You remember. And it says, it says, and the Spirit of God came to him and led him to a road down in Ethiopia, down on the, on the way to Ethiopia. It, and it was there that Philip was able to lead an Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord. But he was listening. He was led of the Spirit. You remember Peter was up on the roof and he was praying. And the Spirit of God came and said, there's men at the door, go with them. Being led of the Spirit. Paul, Paul's plan was to go to Mysa, but the Spirit of God led him another way. Friends, the Spirit of God will lead you. God's voice will direct you. If you have the Spirit of God working in you, but you can't have that happen unless you're saved. You have to be saved. You have to have the Spirit of God working. You have to be separated. You have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what Romans 12 says. A renewed mind in God's Word. Getting rid of the old ways of thinking, the old standards, the old thought life. Everything becomes new, you see. That's what we have to do in order to hear the voice of God. We have to be separated, have the Spirit working, pulling ourselves away. God still speaks today. But the most important thing you have to do is first you have to be saved. Maybe you're listening to this. Maybe you've happened to bump into this. And you're thinking, man, I would really like to hear the voice of God. Maybe there's so many other voices that's been competing for your attention. Maybe you've been led astray by the voice of the devil or you've been led astray by the voice of man or the voice of the demons or even your own self. And you're thinking, you know, I've never trust Jesus as Lord. I really want to trust Jesus to be my Lord. Maybe you're asking the question, what do I have to do to make Jesus Lord of my life? My friend, there's, there's three things that you have to do according to Scripture. First, the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. That means we've all sinned. We have to come to that place where we admit, yes, I know that I have sinned. You say, what is sin? Lying, stealing, gossiping, backbiting, covetousness, lusting. You see, we've broken them. We know the Bible also says the wages of sin is death. That's eternal death that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is death. Eternal death in the place called hell with no escape, no way out. I heard someone say one time, God is not in hell. Yes, He is. His wrath and His anger and His fury and His judgment is being poured out daily and nightly with no end. You see, hell was not created for man. It was created for the rebellious angels that led the uprising when they were cast out. But then those who have been led away in the rebellion that have not made Jesus Lord, that die with sin in their life, they go to the same place because they die in rebellion. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You see, God demonstrated, God expressed, God showed His love for us. And that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. What must you do to be saved? Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died and rose again and can take away your sins. And then confess Him as Lord. Make Him Lord of your life. Receive Him as Savior. Romans 10, 9. It says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever, that means whosoever, that means Africans, uh, Americans, Asians, Middle Easterns, Filipinos, Nepalese, Chinese, Bengalis, it doesn't matter. That means whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life today, you'll not hear the voice of God until you make Jesus Lord. You say, Pastor, I want to make Him Lord. I want Jesus to save me today. As I said, the prayer does not save you. Praying and asking Jesus in your heart does not save you. It's about making Him Lord of your life. That means if you make Jesus Lord, you're going to have to study your Bible. It means you're going to have to pray every day. It means you're going to have to be part of a good church family so that you can get fed the Word of God and grow thereby. That's what it means. You see, it's a commitment. Salvation. Today, if, if you say, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life, I've not made Jesus Lord, but I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. Realizing that it's a commitment, I want you to pray with me today. Now, the prayer doesn't save you, and you're not praying to me, but we're going to pray to Jesus. I want you to pray with me and ask Jesus to save you today. I want you to say, with your head bowed, your eyes closed, I want you to say, Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know I've done wrong. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to go away from them. I now confess you as my Lord. I receive you as my Savior. Take control of my life. I commit my life to you. Use me for your glory, Lord Jesus. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, I want to pray with you right now. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus right now. Father, you know, God, the one that's there, Father that's prayed and asked Jesus to be Lord of their life. Father, I would pray in the name of Jesus, Father, right now, Lord, that you would be more real to them than you've ever been. Holy Spirit of God, I would pray that you would move in and inhabit their very being. Father, I would pray, God, give them a hunger and desire for your word and for prayer. Father, I pray, God, that you would speak most audibly. I pray, God, give them protection, God. Lord, let nothing come against them, Father, Pray, God, Father, that, Lord, you would send in others into their life, God. Lord, that would be a help to them, that would speak life into them, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that you would use them, Father, for your glory. Reveal yourself, God, through your word and through prayer, God, in greater ways. Thank you, Father, for this one. Help them to find a good church home, Father, we would pray. Lord, that where they can get into fellowship with other believers. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, you see the address on your screen right there in the email. I want you to send me a message and say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I want to send you some information on getting started on what it means to walk the Christian life, how you can build in that walk. And if you prayed that prayer today and you asked Jesus to save you, I want you to call a Christian friend and say, I just prayed and received Jesus. Come and tell me some more about it. We're here for you as well. For those of you that have already prayed and asked Jesus to come in your life, I want to pray with you today. Maybe you don't have the Spirit of God working in your life. And today you say, Asher, I want the Spirit of God to work in my life. I don't sense the Spirit working there anymore. I want to pray with you. As we pray, I want you to confess any sin any sin that you might have. Ask God, show me my sin. Let him show you the sin in your life and then confess it. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, Father, we pray. Father, right now, God, show us our sin, Father. Lord, if there be any sin in us, if there be any wicked way, if we've gone astray, Father, show us, God, right now, Father. 
Lord, I pray, God, for these right now, God. Lord, that you're showing sin to right now, Father. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, Father. You see these sins, Father. I pray right now. Now, for those of you that God's revealing sin, I want you just to start confessing those sins right now. Confessing those sins before God. Father, you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray, God, right now, God, Lord, forgive these sins that's being confessed, Lord. I pray, God, for these in the name of Jesus. Father, that the Spirit of God will come back to work in their life, Father. Lord, that they'll hear the voice of God once again. Lord, wherever they've gone astray, Father, I pray, God, bring them back, Father, to that point. Father, thank you for hearing this prayer. Father, we give you praise, God, today. I pray for all of those that are watching this video right now. Lord, help us all to have a, a greater hearing, God, to hear, Father, through the Rhema and through the Logos. Father, that we'll be a greater vessel for you to use, that we might understand your will in our life. Father, we love you so much, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you for the great God that you are, Father. Lord, you're beyond anything that words could even comprehend, God. We just give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming and being with me today and, and learning more about hearing the voice of God. I want to encourage you, get in the Word of God. Study the Word of God. We have more videos that we're going to be making, understanding the will of God, finding the power of God, coming in the glory of God, the greater anointing, the double portion. I really want, I really want you folks to, to have a greater understanding of the Word of God. I really want you to grab onto it, but not just grab onto it, but I want you to take what you learn and I want you to share with somebody. Not to be just a hearer of the Word, but a doer of the Word and a sharer of the Word. Thank you for joining with me today. Take what you've learned, show somebody, and apply it. God bless you so much. Until we meet again, this is George Patton, Frontier Mission International. God bless you.